you find the story of Passover in the 12th chapter of the book of Exodus. And what you find is God told Moshe, he said, tell the people that you are to choose a lamb from the flock. Choose a lamb. It can be either from the sheep or from the goats, but you choose a one-year-old male from the flocks. But God said it cannot have any problem. It cannot have any blemish. It cannot have anything wrong with it. It cannot have any spot. And he says, you bring that lamb into your place. You let it live at your home for several days. And on the 14th of the month, all of Israel is to take the lambs for their homes and sacrifice it and put the blood, al hamezazot, bye-bye, nochon, on the doorposts of the house. You take and you put that blood on there. And God said, this is the most important thing of all of Passover. But we don't talk about this too much anymore. God said, when I see the blood on the mezuzot of your house or the doorpost of your house, I will pass over that house and not come down and judge that house. Now, why was that important? Well, it's important because everybody has sin. Le kulam chatim. Everybody has sin and they've fallen short of God's standard of perfect lives. And so God knew that even the Hebrews had sin in their life, even though they were poor slaves, even though they were weak, and even though they had been treated very badly by Paro, Pharaoh, king of Egypt. God knew that He would have to judge their sin too, so He gave them a plan. He gave them a way out of it, and He told the Ivrim, or the Hebrews, He said, take the, take the blood of this perfect lamb and put it on the doorpost of your house. And God said, when I see the blood, I will pass over that house, and I will not judge the people in that house. Now, if you think about it, that's where we get the word Passover. That's where we get the word Pesach, is that God passed over the house. He did not come down and judge it. So the most important thing about Passover was the blood on the doorpost of the house. If you didn't do the blood on the doorpost of the house, everything else would not do you any good. You wouldn't have to worry about eating matzot, kol ha-shavua. Lama? Because you would be dead. Okay? So you wouldn't have to worry about any of that because God would judge you and come down into that house and judge you and you would go through the same judgment that the Egyptians did. So there is a reason why God said, take the blood from the blemish-free, from the spotless lamb, and put it on the mezuzot of your house, or the doorposts of your house. And then Moshe thought that that was so important that when God finished talking to Moshe and telling him, it says in the book of Hasefer Shemot, Beperek Shtemesre, in the book of Exodus chapter 12, it says that the first thing that Moshe did was he called all of the elders of Am Israel together, he called all of the elders together, and the very first thing he told them was, right now, go and get a lamb. And on this day, we're going to sacrifice that lamb. All of Israel will sacrifice their lamb together, and they will put the blood on the doorpost of their house, and that way God will not judge us. And we will survive, and God will pass over us. So Moshe knew that the most important thing that God had talked about when God talked to him, Moshe knew that it was about the blood covering the sins of the house. And in fact, the book of Leviticus, Vaikra, Viperek Shvasre, it says, chapter 17, it says, God said in the Torah, the blood is given to you for atonement of your sins on the altar. And we also know from Yezkel Hanavi, Ezekiel the prophet, he said that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. 
and all sins are covered by a sacrifice that was made with the blood. And so basically as we get into our message today, I just want to leave you with one thought. Today, Yehudim Ba'aretz, the Jewish people in the land today, they say, well, our prayers are our sacrifices. You see, the problem is, is the Word of God doesn't change. Let's be honest. Let's be real. Let's be realistic. The Word of God does not change. And the Torah still says, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. So we can call our prayers anything that we want, but without the shedding of blood, the Word of God still stands, there's no forgiveness. And you say, well, we can't do the sacrifices because we don't have the temple. Okay, well, here's a question for you. Why don't we have the temple? I mean, did God forget that the Jewish people need to have sacrifices? Sicha uh, shechakti. No, he didn't forget. Did somebody stronger than God come and take the temple away from God? And he says, I'll show you, you won't be able to do any sacrifices anymore. I'll destroy the temple. Well, of course not. No one is stronger than God. The only answer that we have to that, why the temple is not there anymore, is that God no longer needed the temple and the blood sacrifices to forgive the people. What am I saying? Simply this, that God had a plan that he would use his own son and send him because he was without sin. God became a man. That's how you can think of the son. Just like when he became a man and he talked to Abraham Avinu, Abraham our father. He also became a man and he lived among us and was born into a little child's body. We named that child Yeshua. God actually named it. Yeshua, of course, was the salvation of God. The rescue of God. Rescue of God. Who? Hagoel. He was the intercessor. He was the intermediate between God and man. And God said, I will become a man. I will be born into the body of this little child and I will grow up keeping the law at all times so that I will keep my own rules because I want to be the sacrifice to bring mankind back to me but I cannot qualify to be the sacrifice if I have sin in my life as a man so I must keep the law at all times always and he kept the law at all times for one reason and one reason only that he would qualify at being the perfect sacrifice, acceptable on God, so that when God saw the blood of the blemish-free Lamb of God on the mezuzot, or the doorposts of our heart, God would pass over us and not judge our sin. Because the Bible had said that the wages of sin, the punishment of sin, is death. That's what he had said. So now with this story about how God planned to take care of sin in the world, we understand that once the Mashiach came and he sacrificed himself, God knew he no longer needed the blood of a lamb. He no longer needed the sacrifices of bulls and animals because the sin had been removed from man to all who would sit under the blood and take the blood of the blemish-free Lamb of God and put it over their lives. And God said, when I see the blood of Mamashiach, eventually I will pass over. When I see the blood of my son, I will pass over that house in judgment. That's why Pesach is important. That's why Passover is important. It was a memorial. Now you and I today we make memorial days for things that happened in the past. But God knows the future. So he was able to look down all of time and see when he himself would sacrifice his life so that we could be with him and our sins could be forgiven. And God said, I'm going to make a memorial day to celebrate that time so that all Israel 
will always remember what I'm going to do. And he made it before it happened, you see. So several hundred years before, about 600 years before, there was a prophet named Yeshayahu. You know him as Isaiah the prophet. Yeshayahu Hanavi, Isaiah the prophet. And there was a chapter in the book of Isaiah. It was a very controversial chapter. The Perek Hamishim Veshalosh, chapter 53. If you open your Bible and you turn into chapter 53 of Isaiah, actually we're going to start at chapter 52 and we're going to read the last three verses of chapter 52. As Hasefer Yeshayahu, in the time of Perek Hamishim Veshtaim, Vepasuk Shaloshesrei, chapter 13. Now, if you need a Bible or something, we have Bibles and Tanakhs and everything at the back. Just raise your hand and someone will bring you one. We have them in different languages. Now, I want you to understand something. The Jewish people throughout the 2,000 year period of time, they've gone through different thoughts about what this chapter means. I'll give you an example. Almost all of the rabbis up until 1200 AD, up until 1200, almost all of the rabbis agreed that chapter 53 of Isaiah was talking about the Mashiach, the Messiah. They agreed that it was talking about the Messiah until a commentator by the name of Rashi came along. Now Rashi was a very smart man, but the other rabbis were also very smart. Well, see, the problem is, is Maimonides also thought that chapter 53 was talking about the Mashiach. In fact, most of the rabbis did up until 1200. And they said, well, of course it's talking about the Messiah. The only question that we have is some of the verses talk about a king Messiah, Mashiach ben David, who Hamelech. He's the king that would rule and be in glory and would be very powerful and would rule in righteousness. But then as we read the Tanakh, there's also some other places that talk about the Mashiach, but they're saying that he must suffer. And they didn't understand. They thought, well, maybe there's two Messiahs, Ulai Yishtayim. They don't understand, you see. So they said, Mashiach ben David is the ruling, reigning king. Messiah, the son of David. And Mashiach ben Yosef is what they called the other one. Messiah, the son of Joseph. Messiah, the son of Joseph, was called the suffering Messiah. And some of the rabbis said, well, there must be two Messiahs. Mashiach ben David, Mashiach ben Yosef. David was the great and glorious king. So he was the ruling king. But Mashiach ben Yosef, remember the story of Yosef, Basef and Bereshit, in the book of Genesis. And it said Joseph was the suffering person. He was sold by his own brothers. He was rejected. Check this out. He was rejected by his brothers and sold into the land of Egypt. But God was with him. And God raised him up even in the land of Egypt. And God used Joseph to save all of Israel at the time of the famine. And he brought them down and he said, don't worry. He said, you meant bad for me, but God used it for the good. God had a plan. You know, in the same way, we could talk about Yeshua. And I know that one day Yeshua is going to say, don't worry. You, you didn't accept me, but God used it to save everybody. And now God has both the Jewish people and all of the world that can be his if they just believe in what he did. And so Mashiach ben Yosef, Mashiach ben David, the rabbis thought, well, there must be two men. There must be two messiahs. There must be two men because... How can a Messiah be the king and also be the, the guy who's suffering? And they didn't understand. They thought that the Messiah was going to come, he was going to live his life and do good things, and then he was going to die. And then they thought there would be another Messiah, he was going to live his life, he was going to come and do good things, and then he would die. Messiah the son of Joseph, 
Messiah, the son of David. That's what they thought. They didn't understand why there was a suffering servant, Messiah. And one of the reasons why they didn't understand is because of these verses that we're going to read right now. God is describing this suffering Messiah. Here's what he says about it. He said in Isaiah 52 verse 13, I'll read it to you. He says, Behold, my servant shall deal prudently. He shall be wise. He shall be exalted and extolled, lifted up very high. And he says, Just as many people were astonished at you, my people, so his own image will be marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of man. He's saying that I know that you, my people, the Jewish people, have gone through much persecution. And other people are astonished and amazed at what you have gone through. And just like you have gone through all of this hurt, my suffering servant will also go through rejection and hurt. And his image will be, he'll be beat up. He'll have stripes on him. And just like other people were persecuting you, my servant will be persecuted. And then he continues in verse 15. He says, so he will sprinkle many nations. He will sanctify many nations. Kings will close their mouths at him. For what they had not been told, they shall see. And what they had not heard, they shall consider. Now we start in Isaiah 53, 1. And the reason why I started three verses before that is to show you something. See, Rashi says that chapter 53 was a real problem because when we talk to the Christians and the believers in Yeshua, they say, well, see, that's exactly what happened to Yeshua. He suffered. He was rejected. He was, he was cut off from the land of the living. That's what happened to him. So you understand that Obviously, chapter 53 of Isaiah is talking about Yeshua. Well, Rashi said, well, that's a problem. He says, I know what we'll do. We'll say that that's not talking about Yeshua. That's talking about Am Israel, Because the Jewish people had been persecuted by all the other people for so long that surely this chapter is talking about them. But if you start three verses before chapter 53, God says, just like many people were astonished at you, my people, so they will be astonished at my servant. And then it goes on to say about his servant, he shall do this. He will be rejected. He will be despised. Not they will be rejected. Not they will be despised. But he will be despised. He will be cut off. And it's talking about a man, not a nation. And if you look at all of the other chapters in the book of Isaiah up until 52, God is really not happy with Israel a lot of the time. He's rebuking them for their sins because many of them have gone into idol worship and things like that. Now there's some, there's still many people, many righteous people in Israel. But he was rebuking the nation and its leaders because they were going away from God. And so now he's going to talk in chapter 53 about his righteous servant. Well, see, that's a second problem. Because if this chapter is talking about Am Israel, the nation of Israel, then why is he saying my righteous servant when just two chapters before he's talking about how unrighteous they are? And be believe me, they were more righteous than most of the nations around them, but still they did not match, they did not meet God's standard of perfection. So now in chapter 53, having said that, Let's go back to what the rabbis originally thought before Rashi. And even today, many rabbis, not a majority, but many rabbis still believe that this chapter is talking about the suffering Mashiach, the suffering servant. Chapter 53, verse 1 says, Who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? I want you to understand something as we read this. 600 years before Yeshua came to earth as the Mashiach. 
over 600 years before he came to earth as the Messiah and listen to this and see if it doesn't describe almost exactly his life. Who has believed our report? To whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? Who believed it? Who noticed it? It was such a surprise. Verse 2 says, because he will grow up before him as a tender plant and he will be as a root out of dry ground. He has no form or comeliness that when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He's not a good looking guy. You know, he's not, he wasn't really attractive to people and everything. He wasn't like Shaul, the first king of Egypt that was very tall and very good looking and everything. And this, this man, Yeshua, did not really have anything about his appearance that made people want to come to him. It was how he lived. It was what he said. It was what he did. They understood. They saw that God was with this man, Yeshua. And so it says, there is no beauty in him that we should desire him. No beauty that we should desire him. Verse 3 continues on our 12 verses. And it says, he was despised. He was rejected by men. He was a man of sorrows. And he knew what grief was like. And we hid our faces from him. And we thought he was despised. We did not respect him. We did not esteem him. We did not give him the credit that he was due. We did not give him the glory that he was due. Now if you think about the life of Yeshua. Well he was rejected by his brothers. At first hundreds of thousands of Yehudim would come to him. Bagalil, Bakaneret, Begam Yerushalayim, Begam all of all of the land of Israel, Judea, the Kinneret, Sea of Galilee, all that area, hundreds of thousands would come to him. In fact, the record shows that even the Parsim or the Pharisees said, "What are we going to do? The whole world has gone after him." They were afraid of losing their jobs. Because all the people respected the Pharisees. They all came to the Pharisees. They gave the Pharisees their money. They called them wonderful names. They gave them great respect. And the Pharisees loved this. But Yeshua comes along and he's not looking for respect. But God is doing mighty, mighty miracles in his life. And somebody gets healed. And they can see again and they were born blind. Or a man was not able to walk all of his life from his mother's womb. And he was raised up and now he could walk and jump up and down in joy. And people saw this and they told their friends. It says, you won't believe what happened to me. Look, I know you've got a problem too. You come with me. I'll take you to this man, Yeshua. And before long, thousands were coming to him. And the scriptures say that there were so many crowds coming to him. Kol Yodim, all Jewish that were coming to him to be healed by him, so many that they could not even go into the small towns because there were too many people. And all of these wonderful things, and God had said in the Tanakh, in chapter 52 of the book of Yeshaya, he had said, it is too small of a thing that you should be the one to restore Judah to me. It is too small of a thing that you should be the Mashiach that would restore Israel to me. But God said, I will make you a light to all of the nations that my salvation may go to the ends of the earth. God wanted to save all of the world and he wanted to use the Jewish people to do that. And so through their seed, the Mashiach was to come. And God is now speaking to the Mashiach, the Messiah, in the book of uh, Isaiah in chapter 52. And he said, it's too small of a thing that you just save Judah and that you just save Israel, but I will use you to bring the ends of the earth to me. That's what God said, and he's talking to the Messiah, which is kind of interesting if you think about it, because it was 600 years before Yeshua was born into a body. And yet God is talking to him 600 years before he would become a man. Can you explain that? Can you understand that? I can't. But it just basically goes to show that the Messiah existed before Yeshua was born into the body of a man. Yeshua was with God 
before he became a man on earth. Now, Christians don't believe in three gods. Of course we don't. Shema Israel, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. God is one. But I have a question to ask you. You see, you and I are just men and women. We don't understand how God can exist. Does he look like you? Does he have ten fingers? Does he have two eyes? Does he have hair? Or is he without hair? Is his hair long and white? Is it in a ponytail? Is it short? What does God look like, you see? And we tend to think of God, and we tend to think that he's like us. But you and I cannot comprehend God. God is higher than what our understanding can understand. Consider the four creatures before his throne. It said they have six wings. Two of the wings they use to cover their eyes. Two they cover their feet, and two they fly with. You think that's strange? Listen to the rest of it. When Ezekiel saw them, when Isaiah saw them, and also the book of Revelation records them, it said that they have four faces. One is looking this way, one's looking this way, one is looking this way, and one is looking that way. You can never sneak up on one of these creatures. <laughs> But you see, those are the creatures that the Tanakh records are before the throne of God. Here's a question. How many minds do they have? Those four faces. Do they talk to each other? Guy says, you know, this face says, ah, let's go over there right now. And this guy goes, no, I want to go that way. The other two go, you know, oh, we've already been there. Let's go over here. No, we'll go over here. Do they disagree or do they have one mind or are they together? How come they have four faces? How come they have six wings? If you cannot understand the creatures that are before the throne of God, how can you tell me you understand God? I think we just need to humble ourselves. We need to admit it that God is much higher than what we understand. Can He be three in one somehow? I believe He can. I believe he can because that's what the Bible teaches. You say, well, yeah, that's three gods. No, it's not. It's one God, but somehow he is more complex than you and I can imagine. Go to the Jewish book, the Zohar. It's the Jewish book of Kabbalah, the fun foundational book of Kabbalah, Judaism in Israel today. It's considered to be a holy book from God. And you know what it says about God? It said that God is one. And these, but he has these three parts, and these three are one, and he is three, but yet he is one. That's what the Zohar says. People today in Judaism don't like to talk about that book because it's something that we can't understand. And I, I have to tell you, I don't understand it all. I don't understand how he can be three in one, but I believe the scripture teaches that. There's a place in Isaiah 48, verse 16, to where the three are discussing things. Where the Messiah says, And now the Spirit of the Lord has sent me. And it says, Now the Lord God has sent me, and His Spirit will be with me. And that verse in chapter 48, verse 16, talks about these three that are somehow one as God. It's very interesting to me. I don't understand it, but I believe it's real because the Scripture teaches it. But it says in verse 4, now this is where it really gets interesting. It says in verse 4, Surely He has borne our griefs, and He has carried our sorrows. Yet we thought He was stricken by God, we thought that he was hit by God and afflicted, smitten by God and afflicted. So now we're talking about the suffering servant, but look at what Yeshayahu Hanavi, look at what Isaiah the prophet says about the suffering servant. He has borne our griefs. He carried our sorrows. We thought that he was stricken that he was smitten by God and afflicted. We thought God was punishing him. But it says in verse 5, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our sins. The chastisement of our peace was upon him 
and by His stripes we are healed. By His stripes we are healed. Now, I want to call your attention to something. I think this chapter is a very big surprise for most people as they read through the Tanakh, the Old Testament. Why do I say that? Simply because of this. This chapter points to a plan that God has. That God has a plan to somehow put the sins of mankind on this suffering servant, Messiah. He was not two Messiahs. It was not Messiah the son of David and Messiah the son of Joseph because he was not an ordinary normal man. Since he lived a perfect life without sin, even though he was uh, laid in the tomb, he rose again on the third day. Because it was not possible for sin to keep a person in death when that person had no sin in their life themselves. He took our sins upon himself, but he himself had no sin in his life. So it was impossible for death to hold him. It's just like when someone is arrested and they're put in jail. And they investigate the crime and they determine that no, this man is innocent. We can't keep him in jail. We must release him. That's the way it was with death and the Messiah. Since he had no sin of his own, death could not hold him. They had to release him. And on the third day, he rose. Well now, since he lived the life of the suffering servant and death could not hold him since he rose from the dead and he's still alive, now he can come back as Messiah, the son of David, the ruling, reigning king Messiah. Now he can come back. And so it wasn't two people. It wasn't Messiah, the son of David and Messiah, the son of Joseph. It was the same person who is coming two times. And we miss that little detail, you see. Nobody ever thought that one would rise from the dead. And here I'm talking to you on Pesach in 2012. I'm talking to you on Easter or Resurrection Day in 2012. And this year they're together and they came from the same root. And Pesach came from the Passover story where God said to put the blood of the blemish-free perfect lamb on the doorpost of the house and when I see the blood I will pass over it. And you will not be judged. And God today in Christianity is also saying, when I see his blood on your life covering your sins, I will pass over you in judgment. Otodavar. It's the same thing as we say in Hebrew. Otodavar. It's exactly the same thing. This is the thing that Pesach was talking about before it ever happened. And now that we see the life of Yeshua and his time on the cross and his time in the grave and being raised from the dead by the Holy Spirit of God, we see the two are together. And now these two groups of people throughout the world, the believers in Yeshua are coming back to Israel and they feel like, I need to know my Jewish brothers. And I work with many Jewish datim, uh, religious people. And they are saying, we need to know these Christians that love us so much. Hanotsrim Sionim, Hanotsrim Evangelistim, the evangelical Christians that they've come to help us and now we want to work with them. And so now this is times that have never been seen before to where the two are starting to work together and they're coming back together. And the original Pesach and the Passover and the resurrection that we celebrate today are coming together and we are becoming one again and God's Word has returned to the place where it started. That's what we're seeing and it's a miracle in our time. It's a miracle in our days and you are part of it. We are part of that miracle. We are so blessed to be seeing the things that God is doing today. And now we begin to understand that it was his plan all along to put the sins of mankind on this Messiah. And it says, all we like sheep, in verse 6. 
This explains it everything. This one verse explains the whole love story. It says, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way and the Lord has laid on him the sins of us all. I'm not reading from the New Testament. I'm reading from the Tanakh. This is what it says. The Perak Hamishim V'Shalosh the Pasuk Shesh in verse 6 of chapter 53 of the book of Isaiah the prophet. This is what it says. All of us like sheep have gone astray. That's the way sheep are. If you just let them out and everything, they're, they're just going to go off and one sheep's going to go down and say, Oh, it looks like some good grass over there. I'm going to go over there and do de do you know. They don't know where they're going. And the shepherd sees them. No, get back here. There's wolves over there. They'll kill you. Shepherd has to care for them. But if the shepherd is not there, the sheep will just go everywhere. They'll get into trouble. They'll get killed because they're not smart. And really, in God's scale, and God's type of wisdom, we're really not smart either. We're just children. We need the Lord to guide us in life. We don't know what tomorrow is going to bring. We don't know what the future holds. We need the Lord to guide us in life, you see. And God is willing to be our shepherd. That's why Psalm 23 says, Adonai Rui, the Lord is our shepherd. I shall not want, I don't have to worry. God is my shepherd. I don't have to worry. Everything that I need, He will give to me. He'll lead me to the green grass. He'll lead me to the still waters. He'll protect me. His rod and His staff guide me. He'll set a table before me in the presence of my enemies. He'll anoint me for ministry, for work for Him. He'll lead me in everything I need to do. That also is in the Tanakh, in the book of Psalm, chapter, uh, Psalm 23. But it says in verse 6, the story. I like to call it the story. All of us like sheep have gone astray. Every one of us have turned to our own way. We've rebelled against God. We've said, God, I want to live my life myself. I don't need your help. Thank you anyway until you get into trouble. Until you wander off down there with the wolves and the wolves are coming at you and the first thing you do, you go, God! Remember me. Help. Okay. That's the way it is. You know. We just wander off and we get into trouble. But it says, And the Lord laid on him, the suffering servant, the Messiah, the Lord has laid on him the sins, the iniquity of us all. Now that's a new concept you see in the Bible. Up until this point, we did not understand that God's plan was to take the sins of mankind and to put them on one man. And it could not just be any man. It had to be a man who lived a perfect, sinless life. Because the lamb sacrificed on Pesach could not have a spot, could not have a blemish, could not have a problem of any kind. And then God said, when I see the blood, on the doorpost of the house. I will pass over. I will not judge you if I see the blood of the Lamb of God in your lives. And so I think that verse 6 really says it all. But it's really a surprise. Because for the first time now we know that God has a plan to put the sins of everybody on one man. And we see this now for the first time. Verse 7 says, He was oppressed, he was afflicted, and yet he did not open his mouth. He was led as a lamb, see, to the slaughter. He's the lamb of God. He was led to be slaughtered, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. We know from the account in Abrita Chadashah, or the New Testament, we know that's exactly what Yeshua, Jesus, did. He was led into judgment. All these people were saying things against him. He didn't say anything back. He didn't say anything in return. He was fulfilling this prophecy that was written over 600 years before about him. And it says, As a sheep before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. Verse 8 says, He was taken from prison and from judgment. In other words, he didn't even get a fair trial. 
He was taken from judgment. He was taken from prison by a mob and they just ran it through very quickly and had him killed. And said, who will declare his generation? Who will declare his generation? It's a good question. It says, because he was cut off out of the land of the living. Now that word, cut off, if you look at the rest of the Tanakh, if you look at the Torah, you'll find that every time that word for cut off is used, it's talking about a person who is killed. It's talking about a person who died. They are cut off. And that's what this verse says. For he was cut off from the land of the living. That's pretty simple. In other words, he was killed. He died. It says, who's going to declare his generation? Who's going to declare his story? Who's going to talk about what happened? It says, because he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgressions of my people, he was, he was stricken. He was cut off. Now look at what this is saying. Isaiah was a Jewish prophet. And Isaiah is saying, for the transgressions of my people, he gave his life. He died for the Jewish people. And he died for all of the people. He came to die for the sins of mankind. As we hear that, ver that verse say, you know, in John 3.16, Ki chen ohev Elohim et haolam ad asher natan ba'do et beno et yichido bekal hamemim bo lo yuvad ki vo ansach olam. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever, Jewish, Gentile, whoever believes in him would not perish but have an everlasting life. He came from the Jewish seed because God had said to the Jewish people, you will be a light to all the nations. You will be a light unto the world. And he would use the Mashiach from the seed of the Yehudim, from the Jewish people, to bless the rest of the nations with salvation. But it started with the Jewish people. And he was cut off and stricken for the sins of my people, Isaiah said. So he came to the Jewish people first. But after that, he was taken into all the world as the prophets had said. Verse 9 then says, as we start to close up, it says, but they made his grave with the wicked. In other words, he was buried alongside of other sinners, you see. But with the rich in his death. Now, what does that mean? Well, you don't know what that means until you read the account that happened in the New Testament. And in the New Testament, it says that there was this man, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a member of the council. He was Jewish. He was friends with all of the Sanhedrin, the council. He was a very wealthy man. He had bought a grave uh, that was cut into solid rock. It had a big stone in front of it. He probably planned to use it for himself and his family. But he was so impressed with Yeshua, with Jesus, that when Yeshua was taken down from the cross, Joseph says, I'll give him my grave. And Joseph was a, was a very, uh, Joseph of Arimathea was a very rich man. And so now 600 years before that, the book of Isaiah the prophet says he was buried with the rich in his death. That's why it says that. It says, but because he had done no violence, nor was any deceit found in his mouth. Verse 10. Again, the plan of God. Verse 10 says, yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He is the one who put the Messiah to grief. He says, when you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Now, right about now, you should be scratching your head. You should be thinking, well, wait a minute. I thought you said he was cut off from the land of the living. I thought you said that he died. But now you're telling me he's going to see what happened afterward. He's going to see his seed. He's going to prolong his days. And the pleasure of the Lord will prosper while it's in his hand. If he's dead, then how can all of those things happen? God is showing us in these verses about the resurrection of the Messiah. God is showing us for the first time another surprise. 
that God will not leave the Messiah in the grave, but because he was sinless, the Spirit of God, the power of God, would raise him from the dead. God is showing us that the Messiah would be resurrected. He would be brought back to life. We already said that he was going to be cut off, that he was going to die, but then it says, when you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He's going to see what's going to happen after him. He shall prolong his days. He's still going to be alive. And the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He's still going to be working for, the, for God. He's going to be working for God the Father and doing all these things and interceding for who believe on Him. Because He has been raised from the dead. And as we're talking about the resurrection day and as we're talking about the Passover, what are we talking about really? Passover was about the sacrifice and about Him being uh, sacrificed for the sins of mankind but the resurrection day is talking about how death could not hold him and he was raised from the dead and these two work together and today this year for the first time in a long time these two <laughs> days are together this is of God this is from God you see, God is surprising us with his plans to put all the sins of mankind on the on the one person and now he's surprising us again by saying I'm not going to leave him dead I'm going to raise him from the dead he's going to continue he's going to prolong his days I'm going to give him things to do and he, the pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand and then verse 11 says and he shall see the labor of his soul when he went through all of this for us when he hung on the cross for us he's going to see what happened because of that? He's still alive. He's still looking at these things as they unfold. Death was not the end for him because God raised him from the dead. And he said, He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied, and by his knowledge my righteous servant shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquity. Now there's a certain translation of a Jewish Bible called the Sinai translation. It's interesting when it gets to this verse in this chapter because the Sinai translation, not in the Hebrew, but only in the English translation of this translation of the Sinai Tanakh, it says, instead of saying, by his knowledge, my righteous servant shall justify many, it says, my servant shall make many righteous. It does not say that the servant was righteous because, see, that would be a problem to them. It says instead he will make others righteous. But that is not what the Hebrew says. The Hebrew says, by his knowledge, my righteous servant. Ha'evit Sadiq shali. Ha'evit Sadiq is righteous servant and shall justify many for he will bear their iniquities. He will take their sins. That's an unheard of concept in all of the Bible. We heard about lambs and bulls and things and animals being sacrificed, but this is the first time in all of the Tanakh we've heard about a man taking the sins of everybody else, for he shall bear their iniquities. And now you understand, this was God's plan all along. This was the plan that God had made from the foundation of the earth when he knew that man would sin in the garden and that all would be sinners and fall short of the glory of God. Verse 12 then concludes and says, Therefore I will divide him a portion with the great. He shall divide the spoil with the strong. You know who divided the, strong, uh, divided the spoil? That was the army that won. He's going to get the things that the winner gets because he won. The devil lost. Satan lost. God won. That's just the way it is. You don't have to worry. God is not an equal person to Satan. God is so much higher than Satan that you can't even imagine. It's incomprehensible, you see. Satan is a created being. Sometimes people like to say that, well, Satan is very strong and God's very strong and he's seen 
He's pulling you this way and God's trying to pull you back this way. And it's this big war between God and Satan. But no, God is so much more powerful than Satan that with the blink of his eye, God could take Satan and all of his demons, turn them into powder and shoot them to the edge of the universe. It's not even close. It's not a contest. God is infinite in power, infinite in wisdom. You know what? It's got to be really tough for Satan, you think? Maybe playing chess with God? Satan says, well, okay, I'm a pretty smart guy. I was the smartest angel in heaven before they kicked me out. I think I'll move this piece right here. And God says, checkmate. You lose. God knows. God knew from the beginning of time every move that Satan is going to make. Satan can't win. God knows everything and he's all powerful and he's all wise and the Tanakh says there is no wisdom, there is no counsel against the Lord. And you are his child. You don't have to worry. The only time you should be worrying is if you're not letting the Lord lead you, if you're not trusting in the Lord to lead you through life. That's when you should really be worried because I think if you just analyze your past and my past, we've made some mistakes. But God doesn't make mistakes. I'd rather be in His hands than to know all the facts and give it my best plan that I have. I want to be led by Him. And so He says, By His knowledge my righteous servant shall justify many, for He will bear their iniquities. Therefore I will divide Him a portion with the great. He shall divide the spoil with the strong. Because, now if you didn't get the message so far, here it is one last time, because he poured out his soul unto death and he was numbered with the transgressors and he took the sin of many and he made intercession for the transgressors. He's there before the throne of God right now interceding for those who believe on him. And he's saying, Father, don't worry about judging him. He's got my blood over the doorposts of his life. You can pass over that one, Father, because he's mine. He believes in the Lamb of God that took away the sins of the world. And that's the Passover story, and that's the Resurrection Day story. And they are the same, and they work together. And that is the good news, and that's why it's called the good news is because you can be saved for eternity by believing in the one that came and gave his life for you. The Bible says that if you can confess that Yeshua is the Lord and you believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, it says four words, you shall be saved. You don't have to get a big book of things that you have to do. You don't have to listen to people that wear funny clothing telling you what they think you should do. You just believe on the sacrifice that God sent. You just believe that you put the blood on the doorpost of your life and that God will pass over you. God didn't say, well, here's a book now, Moshe. You give this big book to the people. and They've got to read it now in the next few days because I'm going to do this on, on Pesach. And they need to do all of these things and they must get everything just perfect. He didn't do that. He said, just take the, take the lamb without spot. Kill the lamb. Put the blood on your house. When I see that your sins are covered with the blood, I will pass over that house in judgment. It's not about what you can do. It's about what God has done. And if you can believe in that, then everlasting life is yours.